this morning as we celebrate this season of thanks. Uh, one of favorite hymn of mine, Count Your Blessings. Amen. Will you join me in singing Count Your Blessings?
everything you did to make last week in this transition as welcoming as possible. We thank God for you here. But I said we are excited to serve you here at the St. Rest Church. We thank God for what you all have done to make this transition so welcoming. So we thank God for you. And I'm grateful to God that as we have gone from installation weekend, we walked out of here, everybody was safe and sound. Thank God for that. So thank God for what he has done. And as we move forward, we are excited about what's ahead. Because this time next Sunday, with God's help, we will celebrate 135 years. What a legacy we have here at St. Rest. And next Sunday at 11 o'clock, we will have one service commemorating our 135th church anniversary. And that will be our re-entry service as well. We're coming back into the sanctuary. So please, man, please, sir, make ready for that. As we thank God for 135 years here at St. Rest. Now, I know your concerns. We are doing everything we can to ensure your safety in the sanctuary. We sanitize after every service. Our pews are already sectioned for social distancing. We have members here who will account that there are temperature checks after the door. Everyone is wearing masks, and we will make sure that we have contact information for you in the event we need to do contract tracing. We're doing everything we can to ensure your safety. So as you come back to the sanctuary, knowing you're coming back safe, and we're coming back to fellowship once again. So next Sunday at 11 o'clock, we will celebrate our church anniversary, and that will be our re-entry service into the sanctuary. So please, man, please start making ready for that. As we mentioned in Bible study Wednesday night, we do have an assessment of $135. $1 for each year that St. Rest has been in existence. That assessment can be made out throughout the month. You don't have to come with the whole $135 next Sunday. That's okay. However you feel comfortable to give, as you give, know that that money will be used to steward our uh, worship experience well. Those monies will go towards our building fund to exercise capital projects that we need to complete. Many different things around our campus needs to be done, and that money will go directly towards that. So know when you're giving, you're giving to good ground. That we're doing everything we can to keep God's church in order and make sure that our, his house is beautiful for his glory and for the edification of his people. As we embark on the first uh, Sunday of November, I want to say happy birthday to those who are celebrating birthdays. Happy anniversary to those who are celebrating anniversaries. Thank God for another season of life and another season of love as you celebrate those anniversaries and those birthdays. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Tuesday is an important day. If you have not, go vote. These are crucial times. Amen. And we would be negligent as Christians if we just expect God to do everything when God has put something in our hands to do. And we, as African Americans, have much more obligation to go to the polls. People have died. People have been bitten by dogs, humiliated and emasculated just for the right to vote. It's clear they don't want us to vote. So let's exercise that right. And please, ma'am, please, sir, go out to the polls and vote. When we vote, we win. There's a reason why they don't want us to go, because when we vote, we win. So if you have not done so, Tuesday, make your way to the polls. Let your voice be heard. I am encouraged by what I've seen, because many of us have already participated in the voting process, and thank God for that. But work is not done. Let's go out and vote. And as we vote, vote with the confidence of knowing that God is still in control. Amen. Whatever happens Tuesday does not change God's sovereignty. Come on now. Amen. That even after the election is called Tuesday night, God is still on the throne. Yes. Amen. And we will have confidence knowing whoever is in the White House can never overthrow the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God will still be in control. And that's why we rejoice and that's why we celebrate. And that's why we pray. Because we don't pray to the man in the White House. We pray to the God who sits on his eternal throne. And as we're gathering for a time of prayer, I definitely want to be mindful of those who are dealing with illnesses and bereavement in our family. We definitely want to continue to pray for Deacon Forrest Rogers and his family. The transition of his sister. Continue to keep them in prayer. We also want to pray for Deacon Piper Sr. 
who's been moved to hospice care. Please keep, keep him and the Piper family in prayer. Also keep in prayer Deacon Slater, who is still dealing with his bout of illness, and also Sister Elaine Turner, who had several uh, medical visits this past week. She got good reports, but we still need to be in prayer. And you know other prayer requests that may be in your hearts and minds. And for those who are watching at home, I will encourage you, if you will, comment and let us know what prayer requests and prayer needs you have. Because we believe in the power of prayer. Yes, we do. And we know that prayer works. Not because of our praying, but because of the one to whom we pray. That's right. And because God is still God, God still answers prayer. So at this time, I would encourage you to gather your hearts and minds. Let's go before the throne of grace boldly so we can obtain mercy and find help in time of need. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for being God and God all by yourself. Because once again, we've experienced your goodness expressed in this day that you have given us.
to stay on you because we trust in you. Help us know that the peace of God has us all understanding. We'll guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And now, God, when you answer our prayer, give us a heart that says thank you. When you do what no one else can do, help us say thank you. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First Peter chapter 1, verses 
Jackson again, who faithfully serves in leading us in worship. Thank God for you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. If you have it, please respond by saying amen. amen. Read from the English Standard Version, which reads, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is God's word. You may be seated. Again, as we explore this series, Thank God, I want to tag this text, Thank God for Salvation. Thank God for salvation. First Peter, I believe, is one of the most important books a Christian could read in the New Testament. First Peter is one of the most relatable books to the Christian experience. As we discover in the first two verses, Peter is writing to exiled Jews in the dispersion who have been displaced all across Asia Minor by the hands of Nero. Before there was a Donald Trump, there was a Nero who was so diabolical in his tenure that he tried to do everything to stop Christians from being Christians. These exiles experience extreme persecution simply because they believe in Jesus Christ. It's not just them getting blocked on Facebook. They were dispersed and scattered away from their homes because Nero didn't like you if you believed in Jesus Christ. So Peter writes this letter to encourage these Christians as they deal with suffering for the sake of Christ. And as he does so, he encourages them to find room to rejoice in their salvation despite current circumstances. That's why before he addresses anything else in the book, before he deals with their suffering explicitly, he says in verse 3, blessed be the God. Yes. And Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word blessed means to speak well of. It's the same word where we get our English word eulogy. If you've been at a funeral, you know the eulogist typically finds his best words to speak well of the individual he's talking about. That he's not getting any fluff stuff. He's using the best words he can find to describe and speak well of the individual he's talking about. Here, Peter says, listen, you need to find your best words to speak well of God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we need to bless God? He explains it in verse number three. Blessed be God because according to his great mercy, he has caused you to be born again. Yeah. Speak well of God because God caused you to be saved. Notice Peter 
addresses the how of this new birth. He says that you were born again according to God's great mercy. It's not based on your merit. It's not based on what you have done. God made you born again because of his great mercy. That it's not about what you have on your resume. It's about what he did on the cross. He's caused you to be born again according to his great mercy. Peter then also addresses the what of this new birth. That he says you are caused to be born again for what? To a living hope. That you're not just saved for the right now. You're saved for the later on. That God, by this new birth, gives you a hope knowing better days are coming. Then he explains the when of this new birth. That he has caused you to be born again. When? At the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter essentially says, you've got room to rejoice because God caused you to be born again by his great mercy to a living hope because you have a living Savior. Amen. So as he encourages these exiles who are under the extreme persecution of Nero, he tells them, here is the remedy to dealing with current circumstances. Thank God yes. for salvation. Amen. That's the heart of the passage. That's the message of the text. That's the message I want to convey to us today. Simply thank God for salvation. As we approach this Thanksgiving season, this season of gratitude, I'm well aware of the fact that life by its natural circumstances don't give us a lot of room to rejoice this year. This pandemic has robbed many of us of traditional norms of how we would celebrate Thanksgiving. To where you would normally pack up and go to a certain family member's house. You can't do it anymore because now we're socially distant. I understand that this current time of this political season has robbed us of comforts to be comfortable in our own political schemes because we don't know who's going to be in the White House and what they're going to do. But despite messy politics, we still have a perfect savior. And that's room for us to just, I understand that there are personal issues you face in your own life. But if you have experienced this new birth in Christ, if God has caused you to be born again, there is still room to rejoice in your current circumstances. Here's how you face the problems of your life right now. Thank God for salvation. This passage, this pregnant passage, shows us four benefits we gain from experiencing this new birth. Here's the reasons why we need to thank God for salvation. First of all, we need to thank God for salvation because we have an eternal inheritance. We have an eternal inheritance. Note in verse number four, Peter uses eternal language to describe this inheritance we have from being saved. He used four particular terms. He says this inheritance is imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. And it's kept in heaven. It's imperishable, which means it cannot be destroyed. It's undefiled, which means it cannot be tainted by you or your sin. It is unfading, which means it never loses its value. And it's kept in heaven, which means it's stored in eternal places. This is how Peter describes this inheritance we gain from being saved, that it is imperishable. It is undestroyable. You cannot destroy it. You cannot taint it. You cannot lose its value. And it's kept in heaven for you. It's the same premise that Paul uses when he describes our imperishable body. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, around verse 53, Paul says that this perishable body must put on imperishable. 
that this mortal body was put on immortality. He says it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for we know that if this earthly body, this tent be destroyed, we have another building, yeah. not made by man, right. eternal in heavens, a building of God. That's the language that Peter uses to describe this inheritance, that it's not temporal, it's eternal. That it's not mortal, it's immortal. That it's not perishable, that it's imperishable. And that's a reason for us to rejoice because God, by Christ and his finished work of the cross, has given us an inheritance, a future investment that nobody can mess with. That we have an inheritance kept in heaven for us. But it's in this inheritance we see the full beauty of salvation. Notice again, Peter says that God has caused us to be born again to an inheritance. Notice he did not say that God caused us to be born again from sin. Here, Peter shows us that salvation is not just insurance. Salvation is an inheritance. Too often, we view our salvation from the now and not the not yet. That we view it from a perspective of from, but not to. When we speak of salvation, we say that we're saved from sin. We say we're saved from eternal damnation. We say we're saved from hell. And while those statements are accurate, if all we think about is right now, we limit the work of the cross. If all we consider salvation to be is insurance, we miss out on the full beauty of what God has for us because salvation is not just insurance, it's inheritance. Yeah. Too often, we highly speak of salvation protecting us from sin, but we don't talk about salvation providing us heaven. Yeah. And here, Peter says you don't just need to thank God for being saved right now. You need to be thanking God for being saved in the later on because salvation is not just insurance, it's an inheritance. And that's what Paul encouraged the Corinthians to think. If your hope in Christ is only in this life right now, you of all people are most pitiful. If you think you're getting the best of salvation right now, you are pitiful in your view of the cross. If you think you're getting the best of being saved right now, you're missing out on the full scope of salvation. If you want to view the full beauty of what it means to be saved, you must view salvation in the now and in the not yet. That's why Jesus said, to his disciples in Matthew chapter 6, don't lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves will break in and steal, but store up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust aren't existed and thieves cannot steal. And when you send up your temple, realizing that salvation comes in the right now and the later on, you will be able to rejoice in the God of your salvation and thank God for salvation because you know there are better days coming. That salvation is not just insurance. Salvation is an inheritance. That salvation not only protects you from sin, but salvation provides you heaven. That you know this world ain't my home. I got another building to go to. You can sing like the saints of old. I got a new home. Over in glory. And it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. We can thank God for salvation because salvation provides us an eternal inheritance. Thank God for salvation because we have an eternal inheritance. Second, we can thank God for salvation because we have perfect security. Verses 3 and 4, Peter reminds us that this inheritance is undefiled, it's unfading, it's imperishable, it's kept in heaven for us. But the question is, what happens to us until we get to the inheritance? He answers that in verse 5 by saying that we are guarded by God. 
Don't read that verse too fast because if you do, you'll think that it's just talking about God keeping the inheritance. No, it's also talking about God keeping you until you get to the inheritance. Here Peter is saying that God keeps this inheritance in heaven for you. But until you get to heaven, God's going to keep you until you're able to get to the inheritance he has for you. Notice the parallel that God keeps the inheritance for us, but then God keeps us for the inheritance. That we can go through life's circumstances confident knowing God is keeping me. That as I'm on my way to Canaan land, as I'm on my way to glory, I've got security knowing that God will keep me until God gets to me what he has for me. The word guarded in the text is a military term. It expresses the picture of a soldier protecting a high-profile citizen. That all night and all day, God guards his children until his children get their inheritance. Notice how Peter says we are guarded. We are guarded by God's power and through faith. We are guarded by God's power. Not own power, but God's power, that God himself guards us, and that's a beautiful thing to know and a reason to rejoice, because there is no other power that supersedes God's power. That as we live this life, as we deal with the challenges against our faith, we're being kept by the most perfect, we're being kept by the most powerful being on the planet. We're kept by God's power. And if we're kept by God's power, that means God exclusively is the one who guards us. We're not guarded by God adjacent. We're not guarded by God's representative. We're guarded by God himself. That's what the psalmist declares in Psalms 121, verse 4 and 5. He who keeps Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade on thy right hand. And that's comforting to know because as you are saved, you now have access to perfect security. Every day of your life, every breath that you take, you are being kept by the power of God. As long as you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you have assurance that God will keep you. Thought I had a witness, I'm glad I brought my own. God kept David in the valley of the shadow of death. God kept Daniel in the lion's den. God kept the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. God kept the children of Israel as they wandered around in the wilderness. God kept Peter while he was in jail. Every day you wake up, God keeps you. Check your own resume in your own life. You have lived through a historic pandemic from March to November, and you're still alive to tell the story. God is keeping you. Yes, you may have seen some financial shortings, but you still have food on your table. God is keeping you. Yes, you may have loved some loved ones, lost some loved ones through this time, and you've experienced some grief, but you realize God is the God of all comfort. God is keeping you. That's why you ought to be able to say, all to be kept. By Jesus, kept by the power of God, regarded by God's power. We're also guarded through faith. Here, Peter says, you access this perfect security based off your trust in the one who secures you. That you are guarded by and through faith. That God is able, but you won't experience this security that he's able to provide unless you trust him. While that's comforting for us, it's also challenging for us because this part of the passage puts a mirror in the face of our souls and asks us, do you trust God to keep you? Do you really believe that God is able to guard you in every circumstance? Do you believe that God will keep you? You trust God saves you. But do you trust the same 
same God of salvation to keep you. This part of the passage puts a mirror in our hearts and asks us the simple question, do you trust God to keep you? If you do, then by faith, you know that God will keep you in every situation and not only keep you in every situation, he will keep you to the end. It's right there in the passage. Notice, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for what? A salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, which means not only am I trusting God to keep me right now, I'm trusting God to keep me until he gets me to the place he has for me. Yeah. That as I'm walking this walk of life, I'm trusting God to keep me until he gets me to my inheritance. Yeah. That's why Paul told the Ephesians that you have been sealed to the day of redemption because God will keep you till the end. That's why we're reminded of what he told the New Testament church, that I'm confident in this thing. He who began a good work in us will complete it at the day of Jesus Christ. That as I'm trusting God along this journey, I know God will keep me to the end. And let that encourage somebody right now who may feel discouraged. If you can trust God right now, you can still trust God later on because God will keep you to the end. You've got perfect security. That's why we thank God for salvation. Thank God for salvation because we have perfect security. Thank God for salvation because we have an eternal inheritance. Thank God for salvation because we have perfect security. The text also teaches us we thank God for salvation because we have unspeakable joy. We have unspeakable joy. Shifting to verse 6 and 7, Peter says, the confidence we have in trusting God's guarding power gives us room to rejoice even when we face trials. That we have confidence knowing God keeps us. And because we know God keeps us, we rejoice even when we face trials. That we have unspeakable joy even though we have consistent pains from dealing with inconsistent times. That we have room to rejoice because we know God is still keeping us. How do, where, where do we rejoice? According to the text, we both rejoice in temporary trials and in eternal glory. Let me try my best to unpack this from the text. Look at the tension in verse number six. Peter says, we rejoice in this even though we grieve in trials. It's disjointing to rejoice and grieve at the same time. Because you would consider joy and grief to be polar opposites. That joy and grief don't run together. But this is consistent with what scripture teaches us that for the believer, we are called to joy in every circumstance. So what James says in James chapter one, that we are to count it all joy when we fall into trials of various Kinds. And Peter explains why we rejoice in these trials because we know the reason for the trials. He says, for the testing of genuine faith. That the reason why God ordains temporary trials is to build our faith. That's why we go through what we go through. God sends trials to build our faith. James says the same thing. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith produces steadfastness. Romans 5 and 3. Knowing suffering produces faith. The reason why we go through what we go through is because God is testing the validity. God is testing the genuineness of our faith. Notice how Peter describes the value of faith and the testing of faith. He says, faith is more precious than gold. And he says, it's tested by going through the fire. That 
paints the picture of putting a metal in fire that you put it through a burning process to see if it will simply maintain its element. That's really the test of faith, that God puts trials in our life to put us through the fire to see if our faith is real. This lets us know the most valuable thing that we can have as believers is faith. This is a strong rebuke against the prosperity of the gospel where they'll tell you that you are faithful and you are a real Christian when you got real money. <laughs> Save man after your money. Because there's a lot of broke Christians walking around. Right. Satan's not after your health. Because there are many Christians who are on hospital beds right now. Yeah, Satan is not after your house. Because there's many Christians who are living under bridges right now. The one thing that Satan is after is your faith. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have money, if you don't have houses and land, the question is, do you have faith? But more than that, really this speaks to the struggle of faith because the reason why our faith is valuable is because of its object. Our faith is in Christ. So when we experience the trials of life, not only does it ask us where is our faith, it asks us the profound question, will you choose Jesus or something else? The struggle of faith is not to get more faith. The struggle of faith is not even to get a deeper faith. The struggle of faith is the ability to maintain your faith in Jesus Christ. Will you choose Jesus or something else? When you deal with the injustice that's happening in our land, and you see these unjust killings of our black men and women by the black souls of those who vow to protect and serve, will you choose the culture or will you choose Jesus? When the doctor told you there's nothing left that they can do, that they've done everything else they can do, are you going to choose the doctor's report or are you going to choose Jesus? When politics get messy and you're trying to figure out who's going to be in the White House or in City Hall, are you going to choose a politician or are you going to choose Jesus? When you're living through this unprecedented pandemic and it seems like it's not going to get any better, are you going to choose the health reports or are you going to choose Jesus? This is why God sends trials in our lives because he's testing the genuineness of our faith. He wants to know, are you going to choose Jesus? Or are you going to choose something else? But if your faith is real, if your faith is genuine, you're able to respond to that question by saying, I've decided to make Jesus my choice. That I may go through the trials of life, but Jesus is better than any other alternative. That yes, my health may fade, but I still choose Jesus. That my money may not be where I want it to be, but I still choose Jesus. That this pandemic has robbed me of comfort and loved ones, but I still choose Jesus. I'm tired of trumping around, but I still choose Jesus. Some folks would rather have houses and land. Some would choose silver and gold. But these things they treasure and forget about their souls. But I've decided. Yeah. To make Jesus my choice. The road gets rough, the going gets tough, and the hills are hard to climb. But I started out a long time ago, and listen, there is no doubt in my mind, is there anybody here that has decided to make Jesus their choice? So we rejoice in the fact that we have these trials because these trials test our faith and remind us we choose Jesus. Yeah. But that's just only rejoicing in temporary trials. Heavenly mm -hmm. Lord Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Because we also rejoice in eternal glory yeah. because we know sticking with Jesus makes it all worth it. That's what he says in the text when he says that though it's tested by fire, your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Let me give you the micro translation. When you go through your trials, 
and see Jesus on the other end of your trials, it makes your trials worth it. That the reason I go through is not because I'm just looking to get through. I'm going to see my Savior at the end of it all. And that makes it worth it. So when I see the man who healed my body, it makes my sickness worth it. When I see the Prince of Peace that gave me comfort in time of grief, it made me losing a loved one worth it. When I see the man who put food on my table, when I didn't have food on my table, it makes me being hungry worth it. That when I see the lover of my soul who died for my sins, it makes this journey of sin worth it. So when I see Jesus, amen. That no matter what I go through right now, I rejoice knowing that when I see Jesus, amen. Salvation of the souls. What is the 
outcome of faith, Jesus lives. What is the salvation of souls? We will see him face to face. That we have hope in the not yet because we know we will see him as he is. John says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, that now we are the children of God. It does not appear what we will be, but when we get there, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. Here's the outcome of faith. I'm a child of God now. Here's the salvation of my soul. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm not going to look like him because I'm going to see him as he is. That's the hope we have in the not yet, knowing that one of these old days we will see Jesus face to face. In this pandemic age, it's robbed us of fellowship because now our main means of communication is through a cell phone, which means we FaceTime, we Zoom, we video conference or call folks. And it robs us of a comfort and fellowship because we can't see folks face to face. That even though you see their face on the screen, you can't touch them, you can't hug them, you can't share time with them because you really don't know what's on the other end. That ain't going to happen when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, it ain't going to be a Zoom call. When we get to heaven, it won't be a FaceTime conversation. We will see Jesus face to face where we can love our Savior who died for our sins. So when we get there, we will see the salvation of our souls. That yes, he saved me from sin, but he saved me to an inheritance. I'm going to see Jesus face to face. I will see the man who died for me. I will see the man who was buried for me. I will see the man who rose for me. And I will see the man who came back for me face to face. And until I get there, he's getting me ready for that great day. That's why we can see Jesus is getting us ready for that great day. What's that day? I'm going to see him face to face. What's going to happen on that great day? Sinners are going to be running. On that great day. And the saints are going to be shouting on that great day. But here's my question for you. Will you be ready for that great day? If you are ready, that means you are saved and you can thank God for salvation. That when you can't thank him for nothing else, you can simply thank him because you say, I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how grace can do for you. Here's why I'm thankful. I'm saved by his power divine. I'm saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete. Not because I'm all the way healthy. Not because I have all the money in the bank. Not because all things are well. I'm thankful and I'm glad because I'm saved. Is there anybody here in St. Rest that can thank
death until he comes. To close, I want to encourage those who are willing to give. We have several ways you can give here at the St. Rest Church. You can give electronically through Google Play, Google Pay, Give a Five Cash Out. You can also do PayPal as well. If you're here physically and you want to give physically, we have baskets available at the ends that you can give on your way out. You can also mail in your tithes and contributions. We have a drop.